Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sophie Kwasny. I'm the head of the Data Protection Unit uh, in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg in France. And I have the pleasure to be the moderator of this session on data protection in Africa and the Middle East, state of play, challenges and horizon. Um, as you have uh, noticed uh, on the program, we were supposed to have a great panel with great panelists, and we actually missed quite a, a number of, uh, of them. Uh, but I'm very glad to announce that uh, we are having with us uh, uh, Tiki and Sami, and I'll come back to it uh, uh, later. Um, so I've clicked for the next slide. It doesn't seem to work. Yes, perfect. So um, from what I saw from the other panels uh, in the CPDP, uh, you have us on the screen, but you have also below the actual list uh, of speakers and their bio. Uh, so I was not going any way to enter uh, into a long, uh, long detail about each of the speakers. Uh, but to confirm uh, that we have with us uh, Sami Mohamed, Acting Director of the Office of Data Protection at the Registration Authority uh, in Abu Dhabi. And that we have Tiki Akwete Falconer, who's the founder and executive director of Africa Digital Rights Hub. Um, it's a non for profit think tank uh, that is, uh, you are at least based in Accra in Ghana. Uh, so thank you very much to both of you uh, for, uh, for managing technically to, uh, to reach us uh, uh, today for this discussion. And it's perfect because we have, uh, we're supposed to give a presentation on, on data protection in Africa. And Tiki, I think you really have the Pan-African view of what's happening. And for the Middle East, Sami, uh, uh, Sami is with us, so uh, I, I, I think it's perfect to have your views on the Gulf region too. Um, so let me, next slide please, let me uh, first of all uh, recap and a bit set the scene to this discussion. Um, you, have, uh, you have on the screen the, the visual of one of the studies that was carried out in 2019 by Professor Greenleaf uh, and Professor Cotier uh, on the legislative evolution uh, of data protection laws. And this is the recap uh, per decade. And as you can see uh, in the last column, uh, which is the last decade, there's basically been uh, nearly a 50% increase uh, in the data protection laws just in that sole uh, decade of, of, uh, of the last uh, uh, until 2019. Next slide, please. So how does this actually concern Africa? And there I apologize uh, to Sami for not having uh, uh, his region represented. Um, the, this is a slide that uh, has been prepared by uh, Pat Roche from uh, Privacy Matters, uh, the director of Privacy Matters, who's been uh, very, very engaged and active in Africa. And so um, is prepared this, uh, this visual of data protection legislation in Africa. So as you can see, the green and there are nuances of countries which uh, have already enacted their data protection legislation and some that are now working on it and the gray uh, countries without any data protection law um, so uh, about those 30 34 i think countries in africa have a data protection legislation at the moment what is important to note is that uh, it doesn't mean that you have the same number of data protection authorities uh, because not all the countries that have enacted uh, data protection legislation have actually um, established data protection authorities we count less than 20 dpas in africa and um, the, the Council of Europe, and I think that's probably one of the reasons uh, I've been invited to moderate this session. You could ask yourself, okay, what is the link uh, between uh, the Council of Europe and the Middle East and Africa? Well, the first thing is our Data Protection Convention, Convention 108, uh, which uh, is open to any country in the world with uh, complying legislation. 
And this global reach of the convention has really materialized in the last year. And we count already five African countries uh, uh, that have acceded to the convention. So they have committed to, uh, uh, to respect its provisions. And on top of those five countries, African countries that are bound by the, by the convention and are, that are members um, in the committee of the convention, we also have a number of other African countries that participate as observers in the work. So the, the convention is already uh, applied quite significantly uh, in, in Africa. Um, and that's, uh, um, that's for us, Council of Europe, an important work that we are carrying out uh, um, uh, with our partners in Africa. To tell you regarding some of those grey countries now uh, on the screen, um, we are currently working uh, with the Gambia, uh, with Namibia and uh, Sudan, it just started, on uh, data protection legislation. So this is something uh, which I hope will uh, maybe next year lead us to have some more green on this map. Next slide, please. Uh, what I also would like to say in introduction uh, to this discussion is that the Council of Europe, uh, aside uh, the convention and uh, the participation in the convention and the committee, uh, is also closely, uh, sorry, I'm trying to adjust to the screen, uh, is also uh, uh, actively working with the African Network of Data Protection Authorities. Uh, and um, in this uh, remote uh, way of working, we have offered to the network Network, um, a platform for monthly meetings. Uh, each <laughs> month we, we select uh, a specific uh, theme uh, and we've already had uh, uh, four of those uh, online meetings with, uh, with the DPAs, African DPAs. Uh, and the next one actually of those uh, thematic meetings will be uh, held next week and it will be on, on FinTech. So it's, it's another way for us out of really the standard setting uh, aspect to engage and uh, to discuss some topical uh, issues with, uh, with the DPAs of Africa. Um, next slide, please. So that means I've come now to uh, the end of uh, my introduction to this session and uh, I would like now to uh, uh, reach out to, uh, to my panelists uh, for their presentation. So Sami, if, uh, if you're okay, we would, uh, we would be starting with you. Um, you are based in Abu Dhabi, uh, but you will be uh, providing us with an update uh, on data protection developments uh, in the Gulf region, including uh, in the United Arab Emirates, and presenting the key features of uh, Abu Dhabi global market data protection regulation and the plans of the office. I thank you very much in advance, Sami. Thank the you so much, yours. Sophie. Thank you so much, Sophie. And, uh... I would like to, to send a special thanks for uh, Lassine Anis for arranging the, this event for us. Um, so first of all, I would like to give a quick brief about Abu Dhabi Global Markets, ADGM, for the audience who don't know ADGM. So ADGM is a jurisdiction or a territory within the Emirate of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. It was created by the, 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 the Abu Dhabi government as a catalyst for its ambitious growth plans, including innovation and the financial intermediations. This is in order to advance the growth of the economies in the UAE and MENA region. In addition, Abu Dhabi global markets considered a gateway for local, regional, and international businesses into Abu Dhabi. We have more than 3,000 companies in our jurisdictions. And in order to facilitate that, ADGMs has adopted the England and Wales common law as a legal platform. Alongside with it's their uh, comprehensive data protection law, which is based on GDPR and UK Data Privacy Act 2018. The law administered by the Office of Data Protection as the data protection authority for ADGM jurisdictions. ADGM consists of three independent authorities, which are the registration authority, financial service regulatory authority, and the courts. 
Each one operates within their remits and governed by the ADGM's board of directors. So going back to the panel discussion item, I would like to give uh, you an update regarding the privacy in the Gulf countries, including the United Arab Emirates. With, as we all know that with the increase in the global data privacy regulations and considering the value of the data as a strategic assets and powerful source of economic uh, value, the Gulf countries realized the importance of having a privacy frameworks to safeguard the personal data in line with the best practices. Since the privacy of the individuals are provided under several sectorial levels, with missing a comprehensive privacy law to protect the individual privacy rights across the entire country. So a quick overview on the privacy regime's status in, in, in each Gulf country. So I will start with Oman. And actually, Oman, the draft of the data protection law being under review by the Ministry of Legal Affairs since 2017, and it's still pending uh, till date. In Kuwait, no development yet in data protection field. While in, in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the draft of the data protection law being under review by the Shura Council, which is like a parliament, since 2018 and still pending until now. In Bahrain, the data protection law enacted in 2018, which went into force in 2019, but unfortunately, it's not administered yet by any competent authority. While in Qatar, they have a comprehensive data protection law, which took effect back in 2017, based on the EU Directives 95, and the law administered by the Ministry of Transport and Communication. In addition, the Qatar Financial Center has administered the data protection law since 20, 2005, and it's based on the EU uh, privacy, uh, the EU privacy guide or, or the EU Directives 95. In the United Arab Emirates, at the federal level. There is no comprehensive data protection law, but there is a several laws with the privacy provisions for a specific sectors. For example, there's an article 378 of the UAE Penal Code criminalizing violations of the private life of families and individuals. Where there is another piece in the, the UAE telecommunications law, uh, which criminalize a disclosure of the communications there is another piece in the UAE combating cyber crimes law, which is the federal law number five of 2012, criminalizing the use of internet to invade the privacy of another person. And there is another piece in federal law uh, two of 2019 regarding the use of the information in telecommunication sector uh, and, and in healthcare sector, sorry. So those pieces are like based on based in, in sectorial approach, you can say. On the other hand, there are only uh, three jurisdictions in the UAE that have a comprehensive data protection laws, which are Abu Dhabi Global Markets, Dubai International Financial Center, and the Dubai Healthcare Center, but only applies on those jurisdictions. When we zoom in the privacy framework in Abu Dhabi Global Markets, Next week, ADGM will introduce the new data protection law 2021 that, as I mentioned earlier, it's based on the GDPR and the UK Data Privacy Act 2018. Alongside those laws, we have considered related guidelines, including the Article 29 working parties regarding the adequacy of friendships and the Convention 108 plus guidelines for the protection of individuals with regards of automatic per uh, processing of personal data. The ADGM's data protection law applies on all businesses and ADGM's authority that processing personal data within the jurisdiction. It, it, it places the key obligations on the data controllers, for example, the DPO requirements, the data privacy impact assessments requirements, accountability, a principle and transparency principle, etc. And it protects key rights of individuals, such as the right 
to be informed the right to access the right to objects etc similar to the rights address in the gdpr and the uk privacy act in relation to the personal data transfer the transfer of personal data will be only to jurisdictions that deemed adequate by the commissioner office unless other measures taken such as the binding corporate rules and the standard contractual clauses the law also sets the role and the responsibilities of the supervisory authority as well as the data protection commissioner furthermore it's introduced admin administrative penalties for the convictions uh, or contraventions to the law's requirements which is up to 28 million dollars last but not least um, if we have done a high level comparison between gdpr and the adgm's data protection regulations 2021 we will see that adgm's has similar requirement except the enforcement penalties in gdpr which is broader than the penalties existing in adgm's regime so a kind of comparison when we compare we use the factors of scoop privacy principles data subject rights the response time to data subject request and the government governance aspects as well as breach notification responses data transfers and enforcement penalties and regarding the future plans for the office of data protections um, we are currently revisiting the privacy compliance framework to align it with with the new legal requirements that sits in the new data protection regulations and following that the board of directors will appoint the data protection commissioner to administer the law with the full independence and uh, ability to exercise his powers moreover the, the the office of data protection will focus on the international relations strategy which will formalize and drive the relationships and the interactions with the with the international data protection authorities and the privacy agencies we will continue raising the awareness and educations in the gulf region in the coming years to make sure that the data protections the data subjects are aware, are aware about their rights and the businesses are aware uh, about their obligations and accountable to when it comes to processing personal data so this is an overview about the gulf region uh, sophie and 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 thank you for your attention and the mic is over to you thank you very much uh, sami I'll, I'll come back later after Teki's presentation. I'll come back to you uh, with questions. Oh. Um, so Teki, Africa Digital Rights Hub um, is active in the whole region. Uh, what is your take on the current data protection trends, challenges uh, in Africa, and how can uh, an effective implementation of the right to data protection uh, be secured in Africa? I've notably seen your work uh, in respect of the uh, COVID-19 implications uh, uh, on data protection. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, presenting us the work of the Hub. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, so if, if you look at Africa, and it, it's quite interesting, I think when you look at our history, um, when you look at the uh, current progress that has been made in the last few years, you would see also see a similar graph matching the rest of the world, where there's been a significant increase in the last decade over the number of African countries that have adopted and implemented data protection. This has been driven by a number of factors. Um, as you may be aware, Africa has strategically positioned itself for economic growth and development and sees itself as, you know, um, as sees the harnessing of ICTs as a, a critical tool to do that. And in order to enable this, you really have to build a trust framework that allows for the easy sharing of information and use of data within this ecosystem and this has predominantly driven um you know the adoption and use of uh, data protection frameworks 
uh, within the various regions at the continent level and in the respective countries. Uh, currently, at the regional level, we have um, a one continental framework, what is also known as the Malabo Convention. And then we have uh, three regional frameworks. We have the ECOWAS Directive on Personal Data Protection, the EAC um, framework of, on cyber uh, laws, and then there's also a framework in the SADC region as well. Most of the laws that you're going to find in the countries and, and in the region at the regional framework levels have mainly been influenced by the OECD guidelines, uh, the EU, earlier EU Directive 95, and then Convention 108. Um, and, and that has also been because most of our countries have constitutional provisions that recognize the right to privacy as a fundamental right. And this has mainly underpinned uh, the, the nature of the data protection laws that we have adopted. In terms of style, you tend to see that a lot of our countries have gone for um, an omnibus regulatory approach similar to what you find in Europe, where you have a regulator regulating all industries uh, with, with a human uh, right-centered approach towards dealing with data protection issues. And I believe this is predominantly uh, because of the peculiarity of our ecosystem and the way our legal systems are structured. As at my last count, which was July 2020, there were about 29 African countries uh, with legislations that regulate data protection and privacy, out of which there are about 11 that have data protection authorities. Um, the challenges that we have observed, uh, which hinder enforcement in the region, um, not just, and, and it's not just the pandemic, but probably because the pandemic has increased um, the need to collect and, and use more information, it's even highlighting the extent of these challenges. You know, most of it has to do with provision of adequate resources for the data protection regulators, especially. Uh, we've seen lack of financial resources for both uh, data controllers and processes and regulators. So when it comes to, you know, implementation of data protection is not cheap. And a lot of our continent does not, most of these organizations, sometimes they're very young organizations that are being called upon to implement various frameworks, which um, also collect personal information. And if you go into it, the cost of getting an expert to put together a framework that will enable compliance can be quite expensive. Um, another of the issue has to do with the technical resources and capabilities. They are, they are almost next to none. It is possibly maybe in the last five years that we've gradually seen a slight growth in there. But if you want to look at what the ecosystem looks like, you really want to look at the regulators and you want to look at the nature of the capacities that they have because they will have to lead some of these um, you know drive to ensure compliance and and most of them have struggled with resources I myself had to set up the data protection commission in Ghana and I, I personally came to face to face with the challenges of not having adequate resources and how it hinders your ability to enforce in an efficient and effective manner and also in a timely way. Human resource capacity is still extremely huge. Uh, we are aware that Europe is implementing GDPR and you know thousands of data protection expertise has been estimated to be needed in implementing that. If you take a country like Ghana or a continent like Africa, I do not even think that currently we can boast of more than a hundred trained experts in the space that can really help and facilitate uh, compliance. You know, compliance, it goes beyond reading the law and understanding the law, 
but looks at dealing with issues of how do you practically implement? How do you uh, move away from the letter and the spirit of the law to you know, achieving what the intent of the law is? And, and this really needs individuals that are well educated and vexed in the law, individuals that are trained to understand um, you know, the, the practical implications of some of these challenges. And we continue to see how this has hindered um, efficient implementation and enforcement of, of data protection. Of course, um, the effects of the regional instruments, I would say, have been very good. Um, it, it, it has more or less um, facilitated the adoption of a number of national uh, frameworks as well. What has been missing in, in terms of the effects of regional instruments has been, you know, a strategic um, support and implementation uh, process that will enable countries that are, you know, putting in place some of these regional or continental frameworks uh, do it eff effectively. Essentially, we have these regional frameworks that are there and the countries will have to adopt it, but beyond that, they don't get the needed support, you know, by way of training or other forms to enable them efficiently implement it. African countries, I believe, are in the position uh, themselves to effective, effectively and efficiently manage data protection. But in, in my opinion, this can be done uh, better if we put in place collaboration um, approaches and we collaborate with each other. So by each other, I'm talking about both regulators and, and data controllers and processes collaborating with each other to work on on, on, on compliance and then also um, collaboration at the um, international level with international players. From my own experience, when we started implementing Ghana's data protection in, in 2012, our, our engagement with uh, the Information Commissioner's Office um, helped a lot in shaping uh, the vision that we ended up developing for the country and how we ended up going about implementation in Ghana. And, and I think those collaboration will be very key and critical if we are going to have a, a very efficient ecosystem. The other thing is also collaboration between the regulators and the key stakeholders. Um, the, the biggest challenge is that uh, unfortunately, and I think that problem resonates with almost all the regulators because I've had a lot of interactions with them. They are not fully and financially resourced, not one of them. And so it means that usually you have a regulator that is overburdened uh, with a huge number of data controllers and processes that is supposed to uh, work with to enable compliance and enforcement. And if you do not build bridges between the stakeholders to encourage data protection as, um, you know, as a going concern, as, as a strategy that is very critical for businesses to have and very important, but more, um, but, but then you position yourself more in the policing state as a regulator, you will have challenges because a lot of the time you do not have adequate resources. And so I believe that collaboration with stakeholders, particularly industry, uh, civil society organizations is very critical. And even other state agencies, because um, sometimes uh, data protection regulators have to work with other state agencies you know, to enforce and, and facilitate compliance. So this puts us ahead, it puts them ahead of the issues. It brings them in close proximity with what is happening in the space. And, and then it can facilitate also awareness creation, which is a very critical component for a budding data protection ecosystem um, that we have in, in, in Africa. Thank you very much, Tiki. Um, if, if I can ask to the, 
tech team behind to make the three of us visible because I, I would like to have this more as a conversation between us now as a, uh, uh, also to highlight that I still do not have access to the Q&A uh, uh, feature so I, I do not see I can only see as a, as a normal participant actually if there are questions coming the difficulty being that we don't know who's there with us and uh, and uh, I cannot prompt any, anyone to react. Um, so first, uh, to thank both of you uh, for uh, really, to thank both of you for uh, your uh, excellent presentations. Um, Tiki, just uh, to come back on, on, on yours because it's it's the latest one. Uh, I think we could have no better presentation of the African ecosystem than uh, than the one you've just made. I couldn't agree with mm, I couldn't agree more with all the points you've been making uh, about the challenges and what is needed. Um, it, I think it's great that as a former regulator uh, that has tried to establish a data protection authority in one of the countries, you are uh, best suited than anyone to uh, to raise those difficulties uh, and uh, and share them with us. Uh, so thank you very much. I've noted your figures about uh, about the African uh, uh, region, and so we definitely don't have the same ones. So we'll have to exchange <laughs> on that. Um, and you've mentioned 11 DPAs. So for instance, is the Kenyan new DPA included in your figure? No, that would no. That was Asset July because okay. the Kenyan DPA PA was not at post at July, so yes. I mentioned that that was as at July. Yes, yes that's uh, that's why I think that's one important news uh, for the region yes. is that yes. uh, uh, in Kenya uh, there is now there is now indeed a DPA that has been uh, uh, nominated and and started working. So I think that's a very positive uh, development. Um, so you you mentioned the struggle of the regulators and only to say and eco because i was this morning on another panel on uh, on ai and data protection as actually a, a means of safeguarding other fundamental rights in an ai context and the the point about the the resources of uh, of the regulators was one coming out very uh, very loudly uh, so it's unfortunate because we actually have a good data protection legislations and I think you've mentioned how the impetus of the regional framework and the Malibu Convention has led to a, a uniformization of, uh, of the laws but then if you don't have the, the, the resources for the enforcement behind that it's, uh, it's clearly a pity. Um, so I'll, I'll come now to Sami and your presentation uh, on uh, the development in the Gulf region. I, I would have a general question for you, Sami, on really where do you think the, uh, the developments in the Gulf region go, uh, in which direction they go in respect of data protection and privacy? And if I may link it more precisely to one of the topics you've, you've addressed. You've mentioned uh, standard contractual clauses, you mentioned uh, BCR. Uh, you, the question of transborder data flows from from your perspective has the Schrems two decision that uh, invalidated uh, uh, the privacy shield. So even if it was in in a bilateral context, how has this been felt uh, in your region and and for your uh, uh, specific authority? Thank you so much, Sophie, for your question. Um, regarding the invalidated of the. EU US privacy shield. We follow the, the, the practice in Europe in invalidating the same tool. So we removed it from our legislations uh, and invalidated. And instead of um, depending on that tool, so all data controllers and processors should depend on the uh, standard contractual clauses or the BCRs for any transfer from our jurisdiction to US. This is like the, a, a, a temporary, uh, we took that as a decision right now, but until we figure out how, how we will uh, assess the US uh, adequacy uh, uh, in the future. And we, we're gonna watch what is, what's the space in Europe, what's gonna happen between Europe and US and uh, what is the European Commission uh, position in terms of that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sami. 
uh, Teki, I think you 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 started your intervention really focusing on the uh, on the value of the digital market for Africa and how Africa is positioning it, uh, itself in, in that respect. Um, and uh, you highlighted the importance of uh, creating a, a, a space of trust. Uh, facilitating data flows basically uh, uh, at the level of the region. Um, we see that there's a huge uh, investment in terms of projects in Africa pushing for uh, uh, digital, digital transformation. How do you see this uh, interconnected with, uh, with the developments in the field of data protection and are those projects um, really uh, taking full uh, full account of uh, of the data protection implications of the of the of of the exchange of data that in the end is is the ultimate goal of those projects. Yeah, um, is it taking? Let me answer your question fully um simply, and then I'll explain it. Is it taking full account of data protection? I would say no. Um, what, what, yes, the, there are a lot of, and, and I think that is really the challenge that I have personally had. Um, there seems to be a disconnect between the building of a digital ecosystem and the implication of data collection and, and data processing within those those procedures. And, and that's something that as ADRH, We've been pushing more for its advocacy. I will give you an example. And in the last year, we launched, um, no, two years ago in 2019, uh, a little over a year, we launched the code of practice um, for data protection uh, when it comes to digital IDs in Africa. And the reason behind that was because even though governments had put a lot of resources into the development of especially national IDs, most of these were biometric systems and all of that. And some of them, they've had the opportunity to hear um, or interact with the data protection authority about you know the need to comply with data protection. Most of these projects have ended there. In fact, some of them even have legislations that recognize the need to enforce and, and implement and protect personal data that is collected. But it has ended there. You realize that very little resource um, is allocated towards helping with those things. And at the end of the day, all most of these institutions want to do is take the box that they've registered with the Data Protection Commission and, and that because they have registered their compliance, which uh, you know very well is not the status because registration is just a first step. But what are you practically doing to, to protect the information that you're collecting and processing? So there's that disconnect. And, and I think that we need to really heighten the awareness, especially uh, with, with the regulators. Just a few days ago, my attention was also drawn to, you know, Privacy International's uh, report that they recently did on the Privacy International's recent report that they put out on um, the, the need on, on use and collection of biometric information and how information was being shared. There's a recent report. And in fact, one of the things that were being questioned was that this is a, um, a project that um, allegedly was funded by the European Union. So the question was that with GDPR in there, didn't the European Union then mandate the implementers of these systems to put in place a robust uh, privacy or data protection framework to facilitate compliance because this report has highlighted risks, you know, of the implication of collection and and um, and use of information which was not 
uh, the original intent on which information was collected. So there's that disconnect. And, and I think that we, we really need to do a lot more. Luckily, uh, most of these projects are being championed by governments. And so I believe that if governments working closely with the regulators are made to, you know, put require this as mandatory, it, it will change things. I, I remember when, when I was implementing data protection and we needed compliance, we had to draw very close to, for the financial sector, we had to work very closely with the central bank you know and so the moment the central bank started asking data protection questions um the financial sector became more and more aware and and they found it very pertinent to comply with uh, the data protection law so we we really need to find a way of linking these two uh, to ensure that that influence is there but at the moment i do not think that uh, we are getting a lot of that done thank you Thank, thank you very much, uh, Tiki. So to let you know, uh, we have uh, indeed feedback uh, coming from the audience. Uh, Veronique, thanks uh, both of you for your presentations, both extremely interesting. Um, and um, so there are questions specifically addressed to you, uh, Tiki, uh, okay. that I will present. Uh, and one which is, I think, not, speci not specially addressed to you, but you would be the one uh, able to respond. So uh, let me start uh, with a question by Iron Martin for you, Tiki. What role would you like international organizations such as the Council of Europe and the EU to play in shaping or supporting the data protection landscape in Africa? Um, I think I'll tie it, uh, Tiki, before giving you the floor to a question by uh, Lawisi Nanis, which uh, uh, concerns the Malabo Convention, and I think it's uh, it's connected. Uh, Lawisi's question is, are there any specific reasons why Malabo Convention haven't been ratified by many countries? And is Convention 108 plus or the GDPR-like uh, regulation an alternative? how this regional slash international tools can reconcile with national legislations. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start with um, why possibly the, the Malabo Convention. So it needs 17 signatures. Um, I was hoping that Mr. Mukhtar will come and give us a recent update, but um, the last count I made, which was possibly a couple of months ago, uh, we had about 15 or, or, or 13 um, rat. We had, a, I think, 15 signatures and only eight or less ratifications, and we need about 15, 17 ratifications to make it effective. Um, some of the reasons that um, I personally have heard from some regulators are that the uh, Malabo Convention itself, if you look at the aspects that deal with data protection, because it deals with both cybersecurity and data protection, and um, there is that feeling that it was based um, on um, on the, uh, the the 95 Directive of Europe. And, and so a lot of regulators believe that, look, um, 95 Directive have moved on, we have GDPR now, so there are gaps. And what, um, you know, organizations such as mine have tried to do in that space is to encourage, because, you know, the harmonization, looking at where Africa is going, looking at free continental uh, trade area, Africa needs to have some harmonized framework. And the principles are not significantly different. So we still personally, I still see it as a good place to start whilst we build moving forward. But uh, some of the feedback we're getting is that. I, I also think that maybe there's not been a lot of push and drive um, within the AU to get it, um, you know, endorsed and, and ratified. And, and you would see that in the last few years, 
we've actually gotten a lot more ratifications and signatures than we had gotten since it was passed almost 10 years ago. Um, so those are the things that are driving it. But of course, uh, these things are also international diplomacy. You know, it takes a lot more time for countries to come to terms with it. Um, it. It takes a bit of time for countries to understand what it really means you know, to ratify it, what are the cost implications for it? Because, and, and so sometimes that also, so we really need to, in order to advance signatures, we really need to look at all the things that may be inhibiting um, its signature and, 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 and ratification to enable uh, that. In, in terms of, um, what what we really have to do um the the international uh, community definitely plays a key role because there are a number of projects that they are um, not just facilitating but they are funding and most of these funds come with uh, various conditions and requirements. And so, uh, like I just mentioned a while ago, if there are IT or digital related projects, I believe that the data protection um, requirements should not just be looked at you know, at the contract stage, and then we take it, we have a data protection framework, but we should look at also providing resource. Um, because I, I think that when you look at our ecosystem, you look at industry, um, in, in my experience and interaction with industry, it's not because industry does not want to implement data protection. In fact, when you speak to them and they realize the value that it plays in their businesses, most businesses are more than willing to implement it. But then it boils down to one or two things. It boils down to capacity. It boils down to whether you have the kind of uh, financial resources that it takes to hire a data protection expert to help you. Because most of these companies, even continent-wide, as I mentioned, do not have these resources. And so I think that some of these uh, large projects, especially projects that are geared towards digitization, should have funding that is allocated towards implementation, not, not just compliance, but implementation of data protection um, frameworks, which will go in to get them the necessary expertise, you know, because it does two things for our industries as well. As we bring in more expertise to work with local expertise, we're also gaining that. And then we grow the eco ecosystem, we grow the human resource capacity around dealing with, with some of these issues. So I I believe that Europe can play a key role by going beyond the advocacy and the laws to providing resources that actually facilitate actual implementation. Thank you, Teki. Uh, we've taken note. <laughs> um, Sami, the, the, the next question is for you directly, and then there's one uh, from Veronique that is, I think, addressed to both of you. But first, the one uh, for you, Sami. Yeah. It's a question from uh, Cory Ebers from uh, the Netherlands asking, uh, is data protection an issue uh, within the GCC, so the Gulf Cooperation Council, and is there a cooperation? Thank you so much. Uh, actually, it's a good question. Um, data privacy, it's, it's, it's a new in, in, in the Gulf region. It's not like when you compare it with Europe and Africa. No, here we have, we have it like since in, in one or, or two jurisdictions since, since 10 years. While the, the most of the Gulf countries uh, don't have such regime. Um, so it's a new concept, even for the people. Um, um, it's, it's, when we start actually uh, establishing the office in our jurisdiction in back in 2015, we raised the, 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 the education and the awareness for all uh, for the region. And, 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 and during our um, uh, dealing, when we deal with the government, uh, in, 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 for example, uh, in, in, in New EE, federal and at the federal level. So we, we always raise the, the, the awareness from our side just to uh, raise the awareness and educations for the people 
to understand the importance of the data protection as a, a human and fundamental right. So in terms of collaboration, um, we have like a collaboration, we have issued uh, jointly uh, with, with the DIFC Commission Office, uh, a working group within the Gulf region. So it's involved the two commissioner offices uh, in, the, in, in ADGM and DIFC, and there is like a participation from the international companies, DPOs, uh, for example, um, um, Karim, and for example, there is like uh, uh, companies from Saudi and and uh, Etihad Airways, for example, since they, they, the, the, the GDPR applies on them. So through that working group, we are raising even uh, the, 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 the awareness and uh, discussing the privacy issues that uh, most of the companies faced in, in, in UAE and most of the uh, DPAs faced maybe in, 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 in a few cases. So yeah, in general, this is the, the matter. Thank you, Sami. Uh, well, you have the floor. I'll, I'll continue uh, with you. We have um, a question from Lawusi Nanis um, re regarding the fact, and you've presented it, that the uh, Abi, uh, Abu Dhabi global market has adopted the privacy framework um, that is inspired uh, from the international uh, standards. And uh, are there plans to extend uh, uh, this to other regions of the United Arab Emirates? Thank you so much. Um, regarding that question, actually, we inspired by a GDPR uh, when we designed our law, because this is the trend now in the world, and 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 uh, it's considered a golden standard when in the privacy field. So we, we designed our uh, data protection regulations and align it with a GDPR just to create and facilitate a similar. Uh, business landscape for, for, for international companies. So by this, uh, we believe that we, we reduce the regulatory burdens for the international companies when they come to our jurisdiction. Um, um, regarding the UAE level, um, there were discussions between us and, and, the, and, and the UAE the, uh, government um, in, for, for the idea of issuing or coming with the, with the new law for privacy in the UAE. However, um, um, they are planning to, 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 to draft actually the, the, a law in a privacy. However, um, uh, we haven't like uh, uh, being updated on what, what, what will happen and what, what, is the, what kind of decision they're gonna do. However, every, uh, jurisdictions around us is inspired by us, by our practice and our participation and our achievements uh, when it comes to privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Okay, uh, we have another question where I think um, I can also bring a part of the response, but it's addressed to both of you. Um, it's from Shujana Guljenska uh, from Ghent University, and it concerns the Schrems II uh, decision. So I, I read the question. In light of the Schrems II judgment, in particular, the introduction of a very high single standard of protection, regardless of the legal basis relied on, doesn't the EU position on international data uh, flows undermine the principles of Convention 108, the non-modernized version? How do actors from Africa and the Middle East react to this yet again increased uh, standard? And I think it's in line with the question I had put to you, uh, uh, Sami, uh, to start with. Uh, <laughs> But because uh, because Shuzana is uh, directly referring to the convention, uh, I, I will provide uh, my take on her question and then I'll, I'll let uh, both of you uh, respond to it. Um, so indeed, it's a reference to the to the Convention 108, uh, for which we will tomorrow celebrate the 40th anniversary uh, of the convention. And I think it's not fair uh, to make a parallel between uh, an instrument that dates back pre the 9546 directive uh, and uh, uh, and the the framework of the EU, which is now uh, which is now the GDPR. Uh, so if we were to speak about articulation of frameworks and how they're 
compatible uh, in this dimension of transborder data flows, I think we should rely on 108 plus, even if it's not yet uh, in force and applicable. Um, but indeed, the, the threshold is, is higher, uh, but we have uh, clearly, uh, um, uh, we have clearly, sorry, I have interference in, in my audio, so it's not easy when you're speaking. Um, the Council of Europe, further to the Schrems II decision, has clearly indicated that 108 plus is one of the elements of response uh, to the Schrems II case. And this is uh, linked to Article 11 of the Modernized Convention that brings safeguards uh, regarding access uh, to data by uh, law enforcement or in a national security context. Uh, so really, I think, and, uh, and, and this is something we've been uh, promoting, that Convention 108 Plus, as soon as it will become applicable, is one of the elements of response. Um, Tiki, uh, can we have your, your take on this, on, on this highest, uh, higher level? Um, I mean, um, um, when, when these things happen, um, for of course, its impact when, when you look at Africa, you, you definitely know that it affects, um, you know, uh, transfer of information as well between uh, Europe and Africa. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think it even raises higher questions around um how africa is positioning itself to facilitate uh, data collection and use within uh, the respective countries and the outside world it it definitely um increases uh, or it highlights the the importance of having a collaborative approach at the continent level um, between Africa and the rest of the world. And I won't say just Europe, Africa, Asia, between Africa and Asia, Africa, Europe, and then Africa and, and other uh, parts of the world. So especially when um, our objective is to position the continent to be able to trade effectively with other parts of the world. So um, decisions like this really um, challenge, you know, the, the question of whether we have uh, enough relationships that will facilitate it and whether at the continent level we are uh, doing a lot to to build those bridges that will facilitate um, efficient data transfer currently i don't think that um, africa is there thank you tiki um, i see that uh, marguerite with rago bonane uh, has uh, has managed to uh, to join us uh, welcome marguerite uh, on the panel um, uh, Sami, if you, if you allow, because you, we haven't Sophie. had a chance to hear Marguerite, uh, I, will, I will now move to, to Marguerite's presentation. Uh, so Marguerite, I know you had, uh, you had prepared a PowerPoint presentation for your presentation, but the whole sequence of the panel has been a bit, uh, a bit disturbed. So I don't know how, uh, uh, how you want to handle that, Marguerite, if you want to deliver your presentation or if you just want to react to some of the exchanges uh, we've just had. And uh, I'm happy to do as you prefer. Marguerite, est-ce que tu... Est-ce que tu veux faire ta présent? Donc, Marguerite, sorry for the uh, non-French non speaking audience. Uh, uh, I think Marguerite was frozen indeed, so I, I don't know if she's still with us. Marguerite, can you hear us? Um, we, do, we don't see you. Okay, we see you again. So, um, Marguerite, I think, wants uh, uh, indeed to, uh, to proceed with her presentation. So, 
to introduce Marguerite properly uh, for the audience. Uh, Marguerite Wedrea Gobonane is the chair of uh, the SEAL, uh, so it's the Commission for Freedom and Information of the Burkina Faso, the DPA, and she's also the chair of the African Network uh, of uh, Data Protection Authorities. Uh, thank you, Marguerite, for being with us. I think you wanted to focus on, uh, on the work that uh, your uh, commission has been doing last year in the context of uh, COVID-19 and the actions you've been taking. And it's good because it comes back to one of the questions we had uh, from Veronique uh, regarding the impact of the COVID-19 uh, uh, at national level on countries that have data protection legislations in Africa. So I think it's perfect to have your presentation. So if we can start with the slide presentation, uh, that would be great. And Marguerite, you have the floor. Thank you, Sophie, and good afternoon. Uh, my presentation is on the experience of the seal of Burkina Faso in data protection in the period of COVID-19. My plan is uh, on four points. One is the training, second is the communication, and third is support of, for the administration, and fourth is cooperation on cooperation. In introduction, the COVID-19 pandemic since its inception has created an precedent for humanity. The need to stop is free and treat those who are suffering as government to the sort of exceptional measures such as the establishment of a state of health emergency to face the challenges of protection personal data in this pandemic period, the Data Protection Commission of Burkina Faso has carried out several activities in line with its mission as a protection authority. With one a training, with the introduction of barriers, measures, and the impossibility of meeting physically, the, scene, the commission benefited from the support of UNDP by providing it with Zoom platform. This support has enabled, enabled commission to continue its online communication activities with the actor involved in the fight against the pandemic. This communication focuses on the term COVID-19 and protection of personal data. Treated from two angles, a legal angle and a technical angle. The legal angle of the term made, made it possible to review the general principle of the protection of data, personal data in the context of the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, the specific cause of sensitive health data, the problem of geolocation for protection of personal data. The technical perspective of communication made, made it possible to address backtracking issues, the monitoring applications that are being developed, developed in this period of COVID-19 and the implication in terms of data, personal data protection. Those communication were provided by video conferencing via Zoom platform for the benefit of following targets. The 
African Work Network of Personal Data Protection Authorities, the World Bank, the ILF Emergency Response Operation Chorus, the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso. This action, I glad, I glad data and free protection measure best associated with its processing. Recommendation, the commission recollects for entering infected or used by entities must be kept to the exceptional conditions provided for by law. She also recollects that list and trees already be covered. The commissioner recommended the ethical Marguerite, 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 I'm so, I'm sorry to inter Margue Marguerite, can you hear me? Tu peux m'entendre, Marguerite? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we actually have a very few minutes left and you were frozen. We couldn't see you anymore and the audio wasn't uh, excellent. So I'm, I'm really sorry. I know you were not at the okay. end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. Ap apologies for that. Uh, we're all uh, uh, coping with the, with the technique. Mm -hmm. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so uh, what, uh, what I would like to say is, uh, um, and you've seen it, we were supposed to have other uh, panelists with, her, with us, uh, the chair of the Moroccan DPA, Omar Segrouchny, uh, who's uh, apologized for not being able to join the panel uh, due to an emergency uh, situation for him, for him. And we were also supposed to have uh, Mokhtar Yedali, uh, the head of information uh, society of the African Union, uh, Commission. And there I want to uh, make a link with uh, two questions that arrived uh, from uh, Professor Siswe Snail from the South African uh, regulator. Uh, we've We've taken note of your questions, but precisely because I think uh, uh, the representative of the of the African Union would have been the best place to respond to both of your questions, uh, Professor Snail. We will be uh, emailing him, and uh, and he can he can, uh, he can respond back to you. Apologies for that. I've also seen the last uh, question of uh, of uh, Lawisi Nanis regarding the multiplicity of data driven uh, projects in Africa and how actually uh, DPAs are being included in the discussions and the implementation of, uh, of those projects, be, be it uh, uh, digital identity projects or, or other. So, Lawisin, thank you very much for, I think, those excellent and, uh, and relevant questions. Um, I know that uh, from what I'm being told in, in, my, uh, in my headphone, and that's, I can tell you, quite actually unpleasant, we're being recommended to use headphones for a better experience, and then people are speaking to you in the direct in the here when you're uh, actually uh, addressing an audience so it's not easy to cope i ask everyone to apologize us for the little technical glitches uh, we've we've done our best uh, in uh, informing you of the updates on data protection and privacy uh, in africa and the middle east i really want to thank uh, so much uh, our panelists our three panelists for uh, joining us uh, tiki sami uh, and marguerite and uh, we know the CPDP uh, community. It's only uh, it's only now a fixed moment for discussion, but we can continue uh, all together uh, after this. So once again, uh, thanks very much to all of you uh, for your availability and for being uh, uh, such great panelists uh, uh, today in uh, in adapting to the circumstances. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much and you're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.